No one has superpowers. He's indestructible. That's not strength. That's having it easy. Hey, welcome back Screen Crush. I'm Ryan Airy, and this is all the Easter eggs, references, and little things you might have missed in the mid-season finale for... And guys, this show just keeps getting better and better. This first half of the second season has been phenomenal, and the second half is coming in early 2024. So be sure to check back here after the holidays for more Invincible breakdowns. So we open with the flashback to the season one finale. Nolan has nearly beaten Mark to death following their battle in Chicago. Nolan, unable to land the final blow to his son's face, leaves Earth and flies off into deep space. Now it's here that we get a montage of Nolan flying through space for weeks, or perhaps even months based on the length of his beard. Nolan is despondent and feels lost without a car. He allowed his emotions to interfere with his decades-long mission to conquer Earth for the Viltrum Empire, and simultaneously he abandoned his wife and son. I've abandoned my boy! These are emotions that Nolan felt he was above. Emotions that he knows will lead him into being hunted down and killed by the other Viltrumites for abandoning his post. Now here we can see Nolan in what looks like a black hole. Now this reminded me of the black holes we saw in the opening seconds of the Loki season one finale. Now a connection to the Loki series is fitting, of course, because this season of Invincible has introduced the concept of the multiverse to the show, as well as the Kang-inspired character, Angstrom Levy. I won't rest until I killed! So at the black hole, we see Nolan about to throw himself in and end his own life. And this reminded me of a time in the Marvel comics when Loki tried to end his own life by flying into the sun. But once he did, he wound up at a place called the God Quarry. There he became the hero known as Avenger Prime who forms a team of multiversal Avengers to save all of existence. And something similar happened here with Nolan. Right as this character that we think of as a villain was about to end his own life, we see him go to the path of the hero and save this ship of Thraxans from being sucked into the black hole. So perhaps this black hole is foreshadowing that this season of Invincible will be taking more inspiration from the MCU's multiverse multiverse saga. This scene also reminded me of another TV adaptation of a comic by Robert Kirkman, the creator of Invincible and The Walking Dead. In season three of The Walking Dead, we saw the governor get defeated and retreat from his attack on Rick's group. And it's not until episode six, the following season, when we finally catch back up to the governor via flashback. So we go back to the exact moment where we last saw the governor, just like we did here with Omni-Man. After fleeing the fight, we get a flash forward, catching us up with what the governor has been up to during the time that has passed. Like Omni-Man, the governor is sporting long hair, a big beard, and he's wandering around aimlessly with no will to live. Both scenes also have a modern vocal track playing as their respective villains mope about. I sleep beneath the golden hill in this cold, barren place. But that's not where the parallels stop. The governor was a bad dude who did horrible things and killed a lot of people, just like Omni-Man. But deep down, there was still a little good in him. There was someone inside of him that still wanted to do the right thing. The governor took care of a surviving family that he met just before knocking on death's door, just like Omni-Man with the Thraxans. Both characters found new families, new children, and new people to lead. So yeah, I really enjoyed the parallels here between these two Kirkman characters that are no doubt bad guys, but still have good within them. Okay, so now we catch back up to where last week's episode left off. Mark and Nolan are meeting face to face for the first time since their big battle on Earth. This big hug that Mark gives his father reminded me that Mark is a, still a kid in a lot of ways. I mean, he's only like 18 years old. This burst of emotion that Mark couldn't control when hugging his father parallels perfectly with the emotion that no one couldn't control in the season one finale when he spared Mark's life. And both scenes parallel perfectly with the best father and son adversarial dynamic of all time, Luke and Vader. I've got to save you. You already have. So, as we discussed last week, Nolan used the fact that Mark has a big heart as a way to lure him to Thraxa. You are the only one who can save our people from the meteor shower is destroying our world. That's confirmed again here when Mark says that he doesn't care about the people of Thraxa being in danger, to which Nolan says, I know that's not true. When Mark is introduced to his father's new wife, we get a recreation of this panel from the comics. Mm. And this is where we meet Nolan's new son, Mark's brother. Now, if you don't want to hear any minor potential spoilers for the rest of the season, you might want to skip ahead. Time code's marked below. In the show, he has yet to choose his name, but in the comics, he grows up to become Oliver Grayson. In the comics, Mark takes Oliver to live with him and Debbie on Earth. Oliver would later come into his Viltrumite powers and take on the superhero alias of Kid Omni-Man. So, this series has always had fun playing with its title sequence, and this episode reminded me a lot of the Spider-Man Home Trilogy's F-bomb gags. You gotta be What the Except in Invincible, we of course still get to hear the F-bomb. 
freaking kidding me. So all season long, I've been talking about how impressed I am with the attention to detail they have given Debbie and her grief following Nolan's betrayal. In this scene, we see Debbie wondering and contemplating her place in the world, just like Nolan was in the opening of the episode. We also see her contemplate ending her own life as she stood over this overpass, just like Nolan with the black hole. When Debbie visits Nolan's tombstone, we get a reminder that they fake Nolan and Omni-Man's deaths. But it's also important to remember that Debbie is feeling the same grief one would feel when losing a spouse. The man she knew and loved and made a life with no longer exists. In fact, he never really did. I never knew you at all. Later, we catch up with the Mauler who is creating a new clone. Now, usually the Mauler twins make sure that neither of them know who is the true Mauler and who is the clone. Welcome to the world of the living, clone. Don't start. I'm the original. But in the premiere episode of this season, we see all the Maulers get killed when Angstrom's mind merging machine explodes. The only surviving Mauler was left brutally scarred by the explosion, making it to where it's obvious who the original is and who is the clone. Not this time. Now we also catch up with Cecil's assistant, Donald. Now we've talked before about how Donald died at the hands of Omni-Man last season. It's been an honor, sir. <laughs> who are you talking to? This season, when Debbie sees Donald, she's taken aback, and this makes Donald begin to ask questions. Sir, when Debbie came to speak with you, she seemed uh, distressed when she when she saw me. Now, we said at the time that this was not a multiversal variant of Donald or even a clone. Like in the comics, this Donald is... A robot! Here we can see Donald's android looking at the creator left from the explosion last season. Donald conveniently finds his glasses in the rubble, and back at the GDA headquarters, he witnesses his own death via security footage. Who are you talking to? <gasps> Now, you would think that this would confirm his worst fears, that either he's a clone or an android, but I love that they have Donald continue digging for any evidence to prove that he's the real him. This parallels perfectly with the cloning themes that we find with the Maulers and Robot, as well as the multiversal theme of the season, all of which call into question what it means to be the real you. But we'll talk more about Donald and what he remembers here in a bit. Back at Mark's college, we see Amber, William, and Eve meet up, and we hear William say... Hey, it's my favorite non-superhero superhero! <laughs> Referencing, of course, Adamie's retirement announcement in episode one of this season. Life out in the woods is good. Maybe a little lonely, but I don't mind. Back on Thraxa, Mark is still taking in the fact that his father mated with a grasshopper and spawned another son. Mom's going through hell back on Earth, and you were getting it on with a grasshopper two seconds after you left. No one warns that the Viltrum Empire will come for him for abandoning his post, something that we got a tease at in last week's episode when the Viltrumites attacked Alan the alien. Are you certain he sired an heir? Are you certain he abandoned his post? Now, no one knows that the Viltrumites will look down on the Thraxan species for being weak and aging so quickly, and that they will kill them all once they find him, including Mark's new baby brother. And you know, I get that no one has seemingly changed and is acknowledging what he did on Earth was wrong, but I'd be kind of pissed off too if I were Mark. I mean, no one called Mark millions of miles away from home to come and help him protect his newborn child from being killed by the Viltrumites when it was only just a few months ago that no one was like one punch away from killing Mark. What will you have after five hundred years I still have you but the more you think about it you know that Nolan didn't just have Mark come there to help protect his new child Nolan also missed Mark and wanted to see him the same love that stopped Nolan from killing Mark in season one is the same love that led Nolan to bringing Mark millions of miles to meet his new son Nolan longed to have his sons meet yet another example of the emotions that Nolan claims he shouldn't feel or care about you don't understand I'm not supposed to feel this way now, earlier in the episode, we heard Adam Eve mention, Oh, I keep a place in the city. Now, my initial thought here was that she might have used her powers to create another home in the city, or like sold a golden apple like we saw earlier in the season, and then use the money to buy an apartment. But it would appear that she's actually staying at the Guardians of the Globe's old headquarters. During the night, we see Kill Cannon try to steal a power orb from the old facility that belonged to Robot. Should have packed your bags better. Robot. Now, Kill Cannon was one of Invincible's first villains and appeared in the pilot episode of the series, but it's fitting that here he's going up against Adam Eve, because in the comics, Kill Cannon is more of like her villain. Kill Cannon was also in the Adam Eve prequel episode showcasing her origin story. The name's Kill Cannon. Not gets beat up by little girls, Cannon. Now, as the Viltrumites arrive on Thraxa, they land like meteors. We can assume that unlike Mark in the pilot episode, these Viltrums know how to land. But the reason they're landing so abruptly is to strike fear and cause damage. Thraxa lied to Mark and said meteor showers were destroying their planet, but that foreshadowed the meteor shower type landings of the Viltrumites when they come to Thraxa later in the episode. 
When Mark takes Nolan's new Thrax and wife and brother to safety, we see them headed straight for a mountain. There's a slight crack in the mountain that's an entrance to essentially a safe house that is totally a play on Superman's Fortress of Solitude. As they were approaching the mountain, I was reminded of this scene in Thor The Dark World, where Thor and Loki are trying to escape Asgard via a small crack in the side of a mountain that has access to the Bifrost. If it were easy, everyone would do it. Are you mad? Possibly. This show uses imagery from other comic book shows and movies all the time, so I would not be surprised if this was purposeful. Thor and Loki are probably the most notable brother duo in the genre. Thor and Loki also share a complicated relationship, similar to the relationship we can expect Mark and Oliver to have in the future. So, as Mark is protecting his new brother and stepmother from Lucan, we see Nolan roll in to help. And it's so weird being happy to see Nolan after the first season made us hate him so much. When Lucan says that Nolan has betrayed his people and deserves to die, we hear Nolan say, I know. And this gives us a glimpse into Nolan's psyche. He is still uncomfortable with the fact that he's allowed his emotions to push him to betray his Viltrumite ancestry, and part of him agrees that he deserves to die. After Nolan defeats Luke, and we can see him embrace his new wife, Andressa, happy that she's alive. And I gotta say, this kind of pissed me off for Debbie. Nolan's known this woman for like a few months, while he has been married to Debbie for 20 years and still called her his pet. I do love your mother, but she's more like a, a pet to me. Back on Earth, we see Eve and Kill Cannon still going at it. That fight was so long. Now you can tell that Eve's retirement has left her bottled up with the desire to fight. And this is resulting in her being reckless in her fight with Kill Cannon. <laughs> this car going over the bridge reminded me so much of The Amazing Spider-Man and Spider-Man No Way Home and Superman and a lot of other superhero stories. Now, I don't think we were shown this fight between Eve and Kill Cannon for no reason. This episode already had plenty of fighting. I think this is setting up Eve to rejoin the Guardians of the Globe. Her reckless handling of this fight with Kill Cannon resulted in a lot of civilian casualties. Check for breathing and pulse. I think that Eve will realize that she can't hang up her cape any longer, but that she also can't do things solo. We also got a hint at her missing having a team by the sheer act that she's bunking at the Guardians of the Globe's old headquarters. So I think we'll see Eve return to the team very soon. And I know I've said it a million times, but damn, I love the attention they're giving Debbie in this series and how they're setting up a situation where Mark will forgive his father at the same time Debbie will finally let him go. In this scene, we see Mark and Nolan's costume designer, Art Rosenbaum, voiced by the Joker and Luke Skywalker himself, Mark Hamill, come to visit Debbie and provide some encouraging words of wisdom. Nolan was always off fighting something and you made things work without, you know, need the bum. <laughs> you never did. Back on Thrax, we see Nolan break at the sight of the dead Thraxans, struggling to accept the fact that he's not the cold monster that he's supposed to be. I am having, this is crazy, but I'm having feelings again. It, like, like some kind of 14 year old kid or something. I mean, you remember feelings, right? After Mark learns not to pull his punches when fighting Viltrumites and he and Nolan defeat them, Lucan comes in literally holding his own cuts and breaks Nolan's spine. And as Nolan is arrested and taken away, he pleads for Mark to read his books. Read my books, Mark. Now in the comics, these various books contain secrets on how to defeat the Viltrumites, the same books that Debbie has decided to get rid of. Once again, they have brilliantly set up a situation where just as Debbie has finally let Nolan go, Mark will return with a newfound respect for his father, which will of course drive a wedge between Mark and Debbie. We also saw Debbie almost throw out Mark and Nolan's baseball gloves, a callback to their game of catch in the sky when Mark first got his powers. But the gloves share an even deeper symbolism for Debbie's understanding of the connection between a father and son, and how, despite her hatred for Nolan, she understands that he is her son's father. Now this could be foreshadowing Debbie's willingness to accept Nolan, or at least his son, Mark's brother, who in the comics comes to live with Mark and Debbie. Now back at the GDA, Donald has decided to cut his arm open to learn the truth about who or what he really is. When he sees blood, he's relieved, thinking this means that he's not an android. But as as he looks closer at the tip of the knife, he can see the penetration bent at the blade, confirming that beneath his artificial flesh and blood lies a cybernetic frame. As Donald makes his discovery, we hear Cecil call for him. Donald, where the hell are you? And this gives us a reminder as to why Donald was recreated in the first place, and not just replaced by somebody else. Cecil needs Donald. Cecil feels he can't function without Donald. Earlier in the season, we saw that in other universes, Donald is Cecil's assistant too. All of this suggests that Donald is the only assistant that Cecil can and will accept in any universe, not allowing even and death to stand in the way. You're the only one. On Thraxa, we see Mark lying defeated, paralleling his defeat in the season one finale. And it's here that we meet General Greg, who of course is a play on General Zod. He's Zod. 
Come on. In the comics, Craig is thousands of years old and lost his eye to the Scourge virus that I'm sure we're going to be learning about in an upcoming episode of this series. But in short, it is a virus that was created by the Coalition of Planets who we met in the previous episode, and it was specifically designed to kill Viltrumites. So guys, that's all the Easter eggs we found in the mid-season finale for Invincible Season 2. Big shout out to the writer of this video, Mr. Colton Ogburn. Now, if you guys found any other Easter eggs, let us know in the comments below or add either of us on Twitter. And if it's your first time here, please subscribe, smash that bell for alerts. For Screen Crush, I'm Ryan Airy. <laughs>